theyeshiva.net. So we'll start today a new Maimer in Lakuta Torah by the Balatanya that deals with the sugya of Elul Rosh Hashanah primarily, and that's the first Maimer in Parshas Nitzavim. It's actually Shoift and doesn't have any Maimarim. Lakuta Torah Shoift is the only Parsha that doesn't have any Maimarim. So we'll do one on Nitzavim. It's uh, page 87. On top it's going to say Savay and Nitzavim. Or Mem Dalit Amud Aleph. Mem Dalit Column 187. Make sure on top it says Nitzavim. In the Hebrew numericals, it would be Mem Dalit Column 1. Okay, this is a mimer of the Balatanya that was said before Rosh Hashanah in the month of Elul in the year Tovkov Samach Beis. Tovkov Samach Beis would be 1802. And it starts off on the first Pasuk of the Parsha of Nitzavim that's going to be read in a few weeks. Two weeks from now. Atem Nitzavim Hayoyim Kulchem Lifnei Hashem Alekechem. You all, Moshe Rabbeinu is speaking to the Jewish people at the end of his life. Sefer Dvarim opens up a few weeks before Moshe's passing. It's the 11th month of the year. It's the first day of the month. Moshe begins summarizing, explaining, and teaching Torah to the people. Basically, this is five weeks before his passing. He passes away, the Gemara says, on Zion Adar. Aleph Shvat, literally five weeks before. He gets up to give his final presentation. Be'er is to the Jewish people. And he speaks. He speaks the parshas of Dvarim, Veschan, and Ekev, Re'eh, Shoftim, Kisetzi, Kisavai, and Nitzavim. And then the end, Vayela Chazinu Bezoy Sabrocha, summarized the last day of his life, literally when he was 120, the last day. As he's finishing his presentation during these five weeks, he turns to the Jews and he says, Atem Nitzavim Hayoyim Kulchem Lefnei Hashem Alekech. Today, you all standing in front of God. And he goes through a list of ten categories. Rashechem, Shiftechem, your leaders all the way till the wood choppers and the water carriers. Everybody is here. Atem nitzavim ayam kulchem la'avrecha bebris. She says, Hine parsha zu koirin la'olam koidem rosh Hashanah. There's the parsha the way it was said the first time. It wasn't said before Rosh Hashanah. It was said in the month of Adar. But we read it every year before Rosh Hashanah. Parsha's nitzavim is always read the Shabbos before Rosh Hashanah. That's what the Psach Halach is, the end of Masech the Megillah, the Rishonim explained, that Nitzavim you read before Rosh Hashanah, and it's brought in Tur and Shulchan Aruch and Arachayim, in the Halachas of the Kriyas HaToyra. So Simen Tav Chavches, we have this Halacha, that Atam Nitzavim you read before Rosh Hashanah. Here the Zohar comes and says a very interesting comment. Umerumaz b'milas hayoyim. This connection is indicated in the word hayoyim, the Koya Rosh Hashanah. Because it refers to Rosh Hashanah. Now, this doesn't mean Al Pipshat. Atem Nitzavim Hayoyim is not talking about Rosh Hashanah. Because this was not Rosh Hashanah. As we said, this was right before Moshe's passing. What he meant today was today, that day. But the Zoyar says that it's read before Rosh Hashanah because Atem Nitzavim Hayoyim, on a Remez level, on a hint level, Moshe is referring to Rosh Hashanah. Kiza Hayoyim, Tchilas Masach, is currently in Rosh In the Musaf of Rosh Hashanah, we say the following statement. It comes from the Gemara Rosh Hashanah of Chavzayim. This is the day of the beginning of your creation. Zehayoyim Rosh Hashanah is Tchilas Masecha. It's currently Yom Rosh So it's almost like a Gzei Rosh Hashanah. Hayoyim Hayoyim. Rosh Hashanah is called Hayoyim Zehayoyim. In this pasuk it says Atim Nitzavim Hayoyim. So there's a correlation. The correlation is that there's a remez that this Hayoyim is Rosh Hashanah. What's the connection between this pasuk and Rosh Hashanah? Shekol Nitzutzei Neshamas, on the day of Rosh Hashanah, all the sparks of all souls, Nitzavim, they all stand up. O Mis'alim B'mkairam Harishin B'yoyimzeh. And they're sublimated into their original source, 
into their Mokra Rishon on this day. Ad Lifnei Hashem. Until they reach that space, which is Lifnei Hashem Alekeichem. Before Hashem. So when Moshe Rabbeinu tells the Jewish people, Atem Nitzavim Ayoyim Kolchem Lifnei Hashem Alekeichem, it's a Remez on Rosh Hashanah, because that's what happens on Rosh Hashanah. All the Neshamas of all Jews, all sparks of all souls, so to speak, stand up and come back to their original source, and they stand in their pristine space where they come from. It's like a return back home. Lifnei Hashem Alekeichem. And he goes through all the categories. Moshe says, Rashechem, Shifteichem, Zikneichem, Shekreichem, Koyle Yishisrael, Tapchem, Neshechem, Gercha, Choyte Vitzecha, Tshayev Memechi. You basically have ten categories of Jews here. And everybody is standing together in front of God without distinction. In this sense, there's no hierarchy. He goes through the ten categories where there is a hierarchy. But everybody, nonetheless, is standing together. He says, Rosh Hashanah, all Nitzutzi Neshamas come back with Hashem. Rashechem, Shifteichem, Vigoymer. As I said, Zikneichem, Shetreichem, Tapchem, the children, the wives, the converts, everybody, men, women, children, the woodchoppers, and the water carriers. Parat HaKos of Esa Madregas. If you look into the Pasuk, you'll see that there's ten Madregas here, ten state, ten groups. Rashechem, Shifteichem, is number two, your leaders, your tribes, Ziknechem, your elders, is number three. Shaitrechem, your officers, your governors, is number four. Tapchem, your children, is number five. Neshechem, your wives, is number six. Gercha, is number seven. Asher Bekerev Machanecha, among all your camps, number eight. Choyte Veitzecha, the choppers of your wood, number nine. Shoyev Meimecha, the walls who carry your water, the water carriers, is number ten. And Moshe finishes, You're all here to pass through, to enter into a covenant with your God, which Hashem is making with you today. So this is a unique moment in Jewish history, and the Zayar associates this moment with Rosh Hashanah. Why ten? Here is already his interpretation. Just like in every soul, there are ten levels. Every soul is comprised of ten components, ten building blocks. Every soul is made up of ten building blocks. Da'ainu gimel sichlim v'zayin midis. Three cognitive powers and seven emotional faculties. They're called gimel sichlim. Three, three faculties that are seichel, they're cognitive. They basically deal with discernment, with understanding, with intellectual stimuli. They're known as Chachma, Bina, and Das. And then you have the seven Midas, Chesed, Gvura, Teferis, Netzach, Choyd, Yisoyd, and Malchus. So this is every individual soul is made up of these ten building blocks. And in order to understand a person and to understand the dynamics of a person, one needs to understand the ten features that make up every single Nefesh because every soul is comprised of all of these ten. One may be more emphasized than the other. One may be more accentuated, more developed. But every soul is made up of these ten faculties. No soul is missing any of these characteristics. Everyone has the Gimel, Sichlem, and Zion Midas. Kach, hine kol Yisrael im koi The microcosm reflects the macro. That's a big cloud. The Prat and the cloud always mirror each other. We say it in the morning, Ein bichlal elo. Masha Befrat. So just like every Jew individually is made up of ten, Klal Yisrael is made up of ten. So the ten are reflected in each person individually on a Pratyasdika level, but the same division is also on a Klal level, that the Klal is divided into ten, which is why a minion, the Rechagav, is made of ten. Why is a minion not nine Jews or eleven Jews or twenty Jews or a hundred Jews? And the answer is when ten Jews come into the room, you have Knesses, you have a, a, a reflection of the whole Klal Yisrael in that room. Any ten Jews. Any ten Jews. When you, that's why whenever you have ten Jews, it's right away going to be Lebedic. There'll always be a disagreement. Why? Because you have a microcosm of Knesses Yisrael here. In other words, you have ten Madregas. And when they come together, and never mind, they come together to Davin, it's already a miracle. And that's why you could say Baruch and Kedusha, and the Shechina comes in, etc., 
all the Jewish people are one koima. Koima means a, 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 an erect stature. Koima is like a full height. Koima achashlema. They're one organism. A koima achashlema means one complete organism. The whole Knesset Israel, you could look at the Knesset Israel as one organism. Even though you have millions of Jews, you have 15, 16 million Jews, say today, but essentially, from a certain deeper perspective, it's one organism. In science, they call it a super organism. For example, you'll have 100 million ants, Lahavdil, working in full synchronization, building an ant colony, 100 million. They're called a super organism. Why? They behave as though it was one person, as one animal. In other words, they work, they cooperate so skillfully together, nobody knows how. That's a unique phenomenon of nature. But they cooperate. You have millions of creatures, right? Without our intelligence, they have much more maybe. And they cooperate tremendously, tre- tremendous cooperation, tremendous achdos. So the scientists call them a super organism. It's, an or- one like, it's, it's not one organism, it's millions. But it's a, the definition, it behaves as though it was one body that works together. My body and your body don't work together. On a physical level, but on a deeper spiritual level, Knesset Israel is a koyma achas shleima. In other words, we do work together. We affect each other. It's 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 a sensitive. It's a very sensitive idea that we affect each other in ways that we often don't even realize or know. Just like you can't say I'm having thoughts and it's not affecting a certain part of my body. Whatever happens in me affects my entire body. To differentiate between one part of the body, another part of the body, and saying, oh. You know, I ate this horrible food, it just affected my stomach. Every, everything else is on, it just doesn't work that way. The body, it's, 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 it's a cohesive, integrated whole. When you look at the kalal of their neshamas, not at the prat, it's called knesses Yisrael. The ingathering of Yisrael. It's one metzias, one cohesive entity called knesses Yisrael. To be able to look at the Jewish people this way is a unique idea. You could look at the Jewish people and see one person, another person, another person. And that's important. That's the prop. But there's another perspective where you look at the Jewish people and literally you see it as a single organism. Knesset Yisrael. It's a unique perspective. You don't see anymore, you're this, you're that, and you're differentiated. Literally, you look at Knesset Yisrael and you see one with a lot of limbs, a lot of organs, a lot of differentiation, a lot of arguments and debates, but one mitzvah, one entity. And thus is divided into ten dimensions, just like you yourself are divided into ten. The fact that there are ten doesn't take away from the oneness. On the contrary, every person themselves is one, and yet they have ten different madregas. When it comes to Rosh Hashanah, Miss Alam Kola Madregas, all the ten go up. They all are elevated. The last two categories we have the wood choppers and the water carriers, which represent lower madregas. And therefore, you may think they remain where they are. So he says, no. You all go back to your source. Here there are quite a few references that the Tzamach Tzedek inserted into the Maimer and go after the brackets, approximately one, two, three, four, <coughs> seven or eight lines after the brackets. <laughs> All the Neshamas are elevated, <laughs> they trace back to their pristine source, <laughs> to the source from which they were hewn, uh, <laughs> right, from which they were carved out, chiseled out. They go back, Lifnei Hashem so, and this is the meaning that Moshe Rabbeinu says a little later. There is a time when Yachat Shifti Yisrael, all the tribes of the Jewish people, are Bisasif Rashayam. They come together, they're Misasfim, Lios Lachadim Keechat, to become. Unified as one. Kizehu klal godl. Here is a klal godl. You have, the Chazal often talk about, there's a klal, and then there's a klal godl, Amru B'Shabbos. The Gemara is medayik, klal godl. It's not stama klal, it's a klal godl. Klal godl means an, over, uh, an overarching principle. 
There's every klal is a principle that includes a lot of pratim, but a klal gadol means it's those super klalim that include enormous amounts of details. He says, Kizel, klal gadol. Here's a huge klal. The chol da asi me sitra de kedusha. Anything that comes from the side of holiness, sitra means side, tzad. In Aramaic, sitra is tzad. Anything that comes from sitra, that's why sitra achra means the other side. Sitra means side, tzad. Anything that comes from the side of Kedusha. When we mean side, we don't mean right or left. We mean anything that comes from the world, from the dimension, from the universe of Kedusha, who bebchinetz noet soifam betchilasa. A klal god is always, the beginning is etched in the end, and the end is etched in the beginning. What does this mean? She'en lo bechinetz roish v'saif. Whenever you're dealing with the world of Kedusha, there's never absolute. This is the top, and this is the bottom. That absolute division and hierarchy doesn't exist in Kedusha. Ah, what do you mean? You're just saying there's Tchilosan and there's Seifa. So this is an expression from Sefer Yitzir, which was one of the earliest Kabbalistic texts. No, it's Tchilosan b'Seifa, b'Seifa b'Tchilosan. The beginning is no, it's no, it means... Um, nailed. Nailed, etched. Right, etched, entrenched. The beginning is etched in the end, and the end is etched in the beginning. You know, the absolute divisions. Are, you're on the top, and I'm on the bottom. Or I'm on the top, you're on the bottom. He's on the top, he's on the bottom. That absolute differentiation is never from Kedusha. There's always no it's What does it mean by Sitra, the side of Kedusha? In other words, the, the, the Hashkafa, the, the world of Kedusha. She'en le'bchin is reish v'saif. In real Kedusha, there's no ultimate reish in saif. B'hubchin is igulim. This is rooted in that term, which is a term from Eitz Chaim, from the Arizal, called Igulim circles. What's Pshat circles? Shanim Shech Mepchin is Soiv of Kalalm. Whenever something is rooted in the world of Soiv of Kalalm, that which surrounds the world in a circle, there's never a beginning, a middle, and an end. Every point is a beginning, and every point is a middle, and every point is an end. Depends on perspective. What's the top of the bull? What's the bottom of the bull? You have Samach. What's the beginning of the Samach? What's the middle of the Samach? Turn over the Samach on its head. It's going to be the same, right? It's not going to change. The bottom becomes the top. The top becomes the bottom. Yes, for convenient purposes, you could say, you're the beginning of the circle. We're starting here. That's what we spoke, uh, you know, Shavuos time, and Masech Rosh Hashanah, the whole problem with uh, the international date line. Where the day begins, where the day ends. There's no way of defining it. When does the day begin? How do you know the day begins in Japan? Maybe the day begins in Los Angeles. Maybe the day begins in Yerushalayim. Maybe the day begins in India. We don't know. There's no way of knowing it. There's actually no objective way of saying, here is the beginning, here is the end. So we artificially impose Arbitrary. our... Uh, Arbitrary. Arbitrarily, we have to impose it simply to make a system. But that's the definition of an eagle. An eagle means it's a circle. And if it's a circle, there's no rush and there's no soif. Any point could be rush, any point could be soif. All Kedusha is rooted in Soiv of Kalalman, in the ultimate circle. What's the ultimate circle? The divine. The divine encircles the entire world, encompasses the entire world. So in any Nekuda of the world, you could say it's Soif, you could say it's Rosh. There's no such a thing. There's a person, he is the essential loser. He's always on the bottom. I'm always on the top, he's always on the bottom. That absolute distinction is never from Kedusha. If it's the world of Kedusha, there's a dimension where you sense the eagle, and in the eagle, the head sometimes becomes the foot, and the foot becomes the head. Is an eagle a circle or a sphere? Two dimensional or three dimensional? I guess a sphere is a better translation. Let's call the eagle a sphere. I think that's a better translation. Yes, thank you. And that's why the Chazal say in Pirkei Ovis, have a shval ruach b'fnei kol adam. You should be humble before every single person. Now we all read the Mishnah. People learn Pekayavis. It says ve'avei shval ruach b'fnei kol adam. But is it serious? I understand you could be humble in the presence of certain people. But come on, b'fnei kol adam. <laughs> b'fnei kol adam. I mean, you know the guy. <laughs> you know the guy. What says you should be humble before him? So many people, Taich, it doesn't mean literally be humble before him. It means you should behave as though you were humble, 
you should treat him nicely, you should have a pleasant demeanor, you shouldn't behave pompously. But it's not always taichik. When it says, it means be'emes. The answer is, In every person, there is something that does not exist in somebody else, and everybody needs each other. And therefore, there is an interdependence that is necessary. The moment you start believing that there is nothing in this person that you really, really need, you're not connected to Kedusha anymore. It's not that he's not connected, you're not connected. That means you're not from the world of eagle, you're not from the world of Saiv of Kalam. The moment this person is rejected and dismissed, and I should be humble before you, what, why should I be humble before you? You're more accomplished, you're more successful, you're more wise, you're more deep, you're more moral, you're all, everything, you're greater in everything, spiritually, on every level. For says you should be humble, have And sometimes you see people who really struggle with this question from their behavior. <laughs> You could see that they really struggle with this Maimah Chazal, Levi So they'll have this fake humility, and that itself becomes a reason for arrogance. I'm so good, I'm even humble. That itself, right? I'm even humble before this, uh, before this nobody, before this garnish. Most humble. Huh? Yeah, most yes. Humble. But the Emmet says that the person is really detached. They're arrogant <laughs> about nothing, because in the world of real Kedusha, the <laughs> tch, there's no Rosh and Saif. This doesn't mean you don't have tremendous mileage the other person doesn't have. But it means there's something in him or her that you really, really need. Here you're a mekabel, you're not a mashpia. Here you're a recipient. And there's no person that's out of this cheshbon. There's no person that... I am forever the foot of Klal Yisrael. And he is the head. No, no. In the, in the sphere, ain't lo yroish v'soif. It could be this person is a godl of tremendous areas. It's what Moshe Rabbeinu is saying. But in another area, he is the foot and you're the head. You're the Rosh and he's the Sif. What he has, he should be Rosh below the designer. What he has, he should be a Rosh and not a tail. No. You should be able to be Megala, that Nekuda in you that's a Rosh. You shouldn't always see yourself as a tail. You should be able to identify that which you have to give. Some people always see themselves as a eternal tale. And their superiors make sure to remind them about that. Right? You're sometimes in the presence of people who make sure to remind you that you are forever the foot. Or not even the foot, the foot mela. You're the, the toe. Actually not that, you're the nail. Which we're going to cut off anyway one day. <laughs> so that's the point. Not in the world of Kedusha, this is not a Yisoyed. That's why he says it's a Klal Gadl. It's not Stam a small Klal. This is a Klal Gadl. It's an over... Uh, what's the word? Overarching, uh, overarching. overarching principle. If it's Kedusha, it comes from Saiv of Kalalman. If it comes from Saiv of Kalalman, then there's no Nikuda that you say, this is completely distant. In one Indian, this is Garda Iker. Ein lo yraish v'saif. If it comes from Saiv of Kalalman, you have no Shemitah on it. Okay, say the, just the, the nekudah here is that there's no absolute beginning or end. Yeah, kulam tzrichim zelazav v'nimtza sheyesh yisro no ma'ila b'chol echad v'echad. There's something. There's an advantage. There's a yisro. There's a superiority. A ma'ila in every single person. Shegavoya mechaveira, and in that sense, he remains higher. V'chaveira tzarich loy. Kamashal adam take a person himself. Shehu bal koyma b'roish v'raglayim. Every person has a structure. The organism has a head. The organism has feet. Nobody's going to argue that the feet are not lower and the head is not higher. Nobody's also going to argue that you can't compare the quality of the brain, the nature of the brain, and the chemistry of the brain, and the centrality of the brain to the organism. You can't compare it to the feet. To say, oh, let's just amputate the legs. Who needs them? <laughs> the legs are nothing. If a person wants to get somewhere without raglaim, you're not moving anywhere. You can have the most blessed brain in the world, you're going to remain paralyzed. You must have your raglaim, you must have your legs. So to dismiss the legs and say, hey, it's garbage, it's nothing. It's a joke. In one Indian, the rush looks to the raglaim and says, Take me. 
Without you, I can't get there. It's not only that the raglayim take you places. They hold up the body. They hold up the head. Without the raglayim, there's no foundation. We go now to 18th century medicine. Sometimes you're heavy in your head. Mekizendam beraglayim venirpa. They would be mekizendam is they would uh, bloodletting, 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 and let the blood flow from the feet venirpa. O mekabel chayis mimenu. When it comes to chius, you can't differentiate and say the feet and the legs contribute nothing. There's a chius that the brain gets from the feet, just like the feet get from the brain. So the bloodletting was sometimes beraglayim. And it affects the brain because there's a nervous system that ultimately connects the entire body. It's one organism. The roish can't function well without the feet. The Jews have to be understood in the same fashion. Yes, you have a pchin of roish, you have a pchin of raglayim, you have the arms of klal yisrael, you have the brains, you have the heart, you have the abdomen, you have the teeth of the Jewish people. You have the liver, you have the kidneys, and you have the feet of the Jewish people. But it's koyim ma'achas shleim. V'nimtz, afilu misha mechashev b'dayti shubchinus roish l'gabe chavei. Even somebody who believes that he is ahead l'gabe his colleague, harei ein lo shleimus pli chavei. He should not think that he can have perfection without the other. V'yimtze chisarim b'nafshe mashe chavei mashlim. And he will be able to find his own soul is missing, that his chavr needs to be mashlamim. And this allows for real humility. Lagabi, your friend, to the point where you reach a state where you can't anymore say that this is an absolute beginning and this is an absolute head. This is a roish and this is an end. This is a roish and this is a soif. And one level, I'm a roish, and another level, I'm the regal and you're the roish. Why? Because you're teaching me. You, I'm a Kabul from you. In the world of Kedusha, this consciousness is always present. There's no such a thing that somebody in the world is only a recipient and not a giver. You have what to take, you always have what to give. And in that sense, you're indispensable to the full picture. Nobody could learn all truth without you. There's something that you need to give to the Jewish people. And this is a Klal Gadol. Every child, every young man, every young woman has to know this. There's something that the entire Jewish people need to get from you. And if you don't contribute it, even the greatest head, the greatest genius, the most spiritual holy man in the world, will forever be lacking this unique, indispensable contribution that you have to give to the Jewish people. And to dismiss or reject his or her role would be akin like saying, we don't need a certain part of the body. Let's cut it off. It's insignificant. That would be not just a fallacy, but it would be a horrible crime and a horrible mistake that would affect the entire <laughs> organism and make the person so much less uh, productive as a human being and alive as a human being. And it's only through this type of humility that they could unite. They can unite to experience the dwelling of God's unity, which comes from Gdusha with Aradosh Vesayf. So here we come to point two. Since Hashem doesn't have a beginning and an end, the only way we can experience God in our life is if we don't have a beginning and an end. The moment we live in the world of hierarchies, I'm the Rosh, you're the Saif, we take ourselves out of the divine, because the divine is one. Saif of Kalam. Hashem is called. Hashem Echot. There's no Rosh, there's no Saif. This is the beginning, this is the end. So when we create that absolute differentiation, it's not anymore the side of Kedusha. It's the side that eclipses the Divine. Whenever the Divine dwells, so we become a Keli for Yichud. Yichud is Baruch, Mesitit the Kedusha, Beli Rosh V'Saif. He doesn't have a Rosh and a Saif. So that allows us to open up to Hashem's unity. Somebody who looks at himself and he, he thrives on separating himself from his chav. The way he builds himself up is by fragmenting himself. By saying, I'm superior. I'm unique. You're a garnished. 
You need me. That's the consciousness that he has. He takes the Rosh and the Soif and he separates between the two. He cuts them. He fra- creates fragmentation. Listen to his words. He becomes a Neufel. He falls into the world of fragmentation which belongs to Sitra Akhira. Belongs to the other side. Not the side of Kedush. He becomes a Neufel. In other words, he's out of the consciousness of the divine, which is always a consciousness of unity. So whenever you see a whole, whenever you see another person or a group of people, the question is, am I living in the world of Kedusha, in the world of Sitra In the world of Sitra Akhira, we thrive on differentiations. I'm the, I'm the head, you're the foot. You're the foot, I'm the head. And we live with it. And we thrive it, and we cultivate it, and we nurture it. And sometimes we feel it's a way of actually motivating people. That you'll be able to reach the top. You'll be able to reach the top of bon- uh, <laughs> all the peasants will remain on the bottom and you will rise to the top. And sometimes it's, some, some people think it's even a motivational, uh, a motivational dimension. It works in business. It's a point of separation. What separates me from the competition? Pay more taxes, the bracket. Your bracket goes up. In the world of Kedusha, he's also, it's also a concept of Rosh Vesav. He doesn't say there's no Rosh and Saif. Just like in a Kaima. But there's no Pirut. There's no absolute Pirut. In one Indian, I'm a Rosh, and one Indian, you're a Rosh. There's that sensitivity to the fact that there's an ego. Ultimately, in another Indian, you're the beginning and I'm the end. In other words, I'm a Kabul from you just like you're a Kabul from me. That appreciation of people are different but there's still an equality in the absolute appreciation that no soul is essentially completely superior to another soul. That's the definition of Kedush. Now you have to understand that this created quite a ruckus in its time. This wasn't such a simple idea. Because many, even today it's not such a simple idea. Often in the history of Kalal Yisrael, this concept was anything but a given. People often saw that the success of the Jewish people is by differentiation, is by creating that Havdalah. There's the Talmud Chacham, there's the Amma Oretz. There's the simple Jew, and there's the Manik Yisrael. There's the Rosh Hashiva, right? And there is the businessman, there's the Yoshev Oil, and there's the Balesek. There's the person who is the godl, and then there's the person who's the cotton. You don't mix. You don't mix. Right? And they felt, fakert, mixing it and eliminating differentiation is, you're destroying the best of the best. You destroy motivation. You destroy a culture of respect, etc. The Balatanya here is making a very, very powerful point, and it's a subtle point. He's not saying destroy differentiation. He's not saying some people don't have unique mileus over other people, just like in the body. You say, oh, the brain means nothing. Let's get rid of the brain, the pinky, it's all the same thing. The heart, everything is the same. Then you create a catastrophe. Everyone has its role. But when you make a period between Rosh and Saif, the Rosh and the Saif become completely nifred. When the Rosh can't look to the Saif and say, and now let me learn from you genuinely, then you become a noifel into the world of Sitrach. That was Korah's mistake. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 They say a Maisa, Geshmak a Maisa. There was a Yid, the fifth Lubavitcher Rebbe, his name was the Rebbe Rashab, Reb Shalom Ber. He was a grandson of the Tzamech Tzedek, who was a grandson of the Balatanya. And he had a chassid, a disciple, whose name was Reb Monye Mozenson. Reb Menache Manish Mozenson. They called him Reb Monye. He was a, a Baltzir. He was a, a Talmud Chachem, an Oyved Hashem. He was also a very affluent man and a big Baltzdaka. He was in the diamond business. This is in Tsarist Russia. And he was very successful. And he would come for Yom Tif to his Rebbe, to the Lubavitch Rebbe, the fifth Lubavitch Rebbe, who lived in the city of Lubavitch in Belarus, a little town there. 
and uh, with, where the name Lubavitch comes from. It's the name of a Russian city, a Russian town, actually. It's not a city, it's a town. And he would come to visit his Rebbe. He'd come for Yom Tov. And he would come once a year, usually. And he had a minig that he would bring his best, his best diamond that he had that year. He would bring it and he would give it as a gift to the Rebbe to give it stocker. Whatever the Rebbe wanted for his tzedakahs, he would give him this gift, and it was like his contribution for the cause. Anyway, one year he came to the Rashab, and there was the process known by Chassidim as a chiddus, which meant a private audience with the Rebbe, where you would discuss your personal life, your personal issues, struggles, whatever it was. Before he went in, a very simple Jew, Mesha Pasha Tayyid, went in and was on Yechidus in the private room with the Lubavitcher for a very long time. And then was his turn, and he went in, and after a few minutes, the, the Yechidus was over. And he felt very hurt. He was a man of great stature, really great stature. And the person in front of him, he knew, was oh, a fine Ayyid, but a very, very simple person. What? Uh, he felt like, you know, he felt the Pchisses are covered, he fell down. Okay. No, so to keep grudges against your Rebbe is not a good idea, because uh, any relationship, you hold grudges, especially between a Chassid and a Rebbe, it's not going to work. So before the end of Yom Tif, at the end of Yom Tif, when he went in a second time to say goodbye, he, he said the truth. He said, you know, I, <laughs> I'm having a chlishus hadas. I went in for a few minutes, and this other guy, I don't have anything against him, but I don't understand. How do you compare? Uh, how do you compare? <laughs> so he tells the Rebbe, spent so much time with him. So the Rebbe Rashab didn't answer. He looked and he didn't answer. Okay, no, what is he going to do? He said what he said, and the Rebbe looked and didn't answer. At the end of their conversation, the Rebbe said, no, let's see the schayre this year, Lamazen the schayre. So he always took out the best diamond. The Rebbe says, I want to see everything you have. So he puts out, uh, he puts out his display, he had in his tash in his bag. And uh, they start looking. The Rebbe starts looking, he picks up this one, he picks up that one, and he says, which is the beauty of the year? So he says, this, this is it, this I'm giving as a gift. So the Rebbe Rashab starts looking at it, at at he's looking, it's I don't see something special. So he starts explaining to the Rebbe how you study a diamond, how you analyze a diamond, how you understand a diamond. He's explaining all this. The Rebbe looks again and he says, I don't see the beauty here. I don't see why it's dazzling. I don't see why it's... <laughs> so he explains again. This happens a few times. And after the Rebbe keeps on insisting that he doesn't see, he says, Rebbe, with all due respect, with all due respect, he says, When it comes to diamonds, you need an expert. You need a connoisseur. You need somebody who's an expert. You have a lot of great things, but this is not your, uh, it's not your forte. It's not your forte. <laughs> Let's not argue. <laughs> so the Rebbe looks at him and he said, "Emes, Emes, but succumbs in a shamas of man eich zayin amomcha." When it comes to souls, you also have to be an expert. And just because you don't see it, it doesn't mean it's not the greatest diamond. So he understood that this was his way of answering. In other words, when it comes to souls, you have to be a mumch, you have to be an expert. That's the definition of Kedusha. The definition of Kedusha is that when you understand Achdus, that ultimately the world is unified, so there's no Rosh and Saif. There's no Rosh and Saif, there's no Nekudah that's really a Saif. It doesn't exist. If it's a Nekudah that's really a Saif, you're not getting it. This has to be able to be an Akuda where over there you have the rush. Okay, we're holding page 87. Daf Mem Dalad Amud Aleph. Mem Dalad Column 1.
Yeah. 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 I don't know. There are my modem of the Balatanya and Shaifta. Why did Samach Tzedek didn't put them in the Kudu I don't know. It's, it's strange. It's not... Uh, it's not an... Yeah. The only Pasha without my Marim is Shaiftim, yeah. It's not like there's no my Marim. In other Svarim of the Balatanya, the set my Marim, Murazok, and you have on Shaiftim, plenty. So in summation, when the Mishnah says in Pirkei Yav is Vehavei Shval Ruach Bifnei Kol Adam, you should be a Shval Ruach in the presence of every single human being, with literally without distinction. He doesn't say if this Adam is a tzaddik, is a chacham, is a great, exalted, and elevated human being, but literally Bifnei Kol Adam. How can that be? How can you practically encourage this type of attitude to be humble before every person? So the Balatani explains that anybody who is conscientious of the truth of nature, the truth of reality, knows that every single human being has a real, real myla, mylois that the other person doesn't have, and therefore he or she is indispensable to the symphony of creation and offers a unique contribution that could not be completed by anybody else and therefore kulam tzrichim zelozeh as he says everybody needs each other and even the one who considers himself a true roish a true head roish bnei yisrael a head of the jewish people in one area he is a complete regal is a foot who needs the head just like the foot needs the head in the human organism. In other words, in one area he may be on top, and in another area he's completely on the bottom, and he desperately is a makabal. Not desperately, but he yearns and craves to receive enlightenment, awareness, inspiration from the other person. As he explained at length. And he says that somebody who does not understand this, who does not see it this way, rather looks at the Rosh and looks at the Saif and creates an absolute period between the two, an absolute fragmentation, a real hierarchy where you're on the top and somebody else is on the bottom and it's just the way it is. It's like an inherent truth. You remain a Shmata, you remain a Toe, and I remain the Brain. And that's how it is. And it goes on Lodotus. <laughs> you know, <laughs> it's just how it is. Somebody who does that and does that in an essential way, and you know, they really have that attitude, they really develop that attitude. I am essentially in a different madrega than you. I am on the top, you're on the bottom, and therefore I look at you, and at best, I'll be nice because it's a mitzvah of being a balchesed. I'll give tzedakah, I'll give you a smile because I'm such a good, I'm so perfect that I even treat shmatas nicely. Right? That itself is a chilek of my, of, my, uh, of my godless. My godless is that even though you're such a garnish, I'm still nice to you. Because I'm a real godl. Because <laughs> I'm a real godl. I'm not an arrogant godl. I'm not a pompous godl. I'm, I'm a humble godl. And therefore I'm nice to everybody. This person has no connection to God. He doesn't know what godliness is. He lives in his own bubble completely. And uh, he was, of course, addressing here, not an abstract concept, he was addressing a real idea, and it's an idea that you see, you see till today. You see till today that even what you would call Erlich Yidin B'nai Torah struggle with this. And the reason is because, as we know already, religion doesn't necessarily mean you have a relationship with God. 
with real godliness. It could be your own little journey. Sometimes on the contrary, people become very arrogant through it when they don't understand what it is, when they're not sensitive to what it is. The Alter Rebbe explains elsewhere in Lekudot Torah, Gas Haruach. The Gemara often speaks about Gasus Haruach. What's Gasus Haruach? Literally means arrogance. Gaiva, Gasus Haruach. He teaches Kedarka, everything has a taich. Gasus Haruach. The Ruchnius is grub. The Ruchnius is Gas. Gas Haruach doesn't mean an arrogant spirit. The Ruchnius, the spirituality, is coarse. Gas means dense, brute. Huh? Fagrept. The Ruchnius is Fagrept. Not the Gashmius is Fagrept. He's not a Gashmi, he's a Ruchni. Oh, but it's Fagrep the Ruchnius. It's core spirituality. He's very into good stuff, but it's, it's coarse. It's, he's not sensitive to the depth of it, to the infinity of it. To be in touch with infinity means there's no beginning and there's no end. And if you can't see that, you're not in touch with infinity. You're in your own game. You're in your own orbit. And that becomes, and it develops into the attitude that there's a real Rosh Vesayf. Now, that doesn't mean there's no, fun, just like a healthy organism, there's a functionality. And if the toe decides one day, I'm the brain, and the brain decides it's the toe, and the heart becomes a kidney, and the kidney becomes a liver, and the abdomen becomes a, an arm, and the eye decides it wants to be a nose, and the ears decide <coughs> that they want to become the pancreas, you understand what's going to happen to the organism. Healthy functionality is based on diversity. And each person, each part, not each part, each limb and organ, creates its contribution. And by the Jewish people, you have that too. <coughs> You have those, we are koi ma'achas. So you have the heads, and you have the stomachs, and you have the hearts, and you have the arms, and you have the legs. That's MS. But that's functionality. This is your tzinner, your unique contribution. But it's never an absolute hierarchy where the brain looks at the stomach and says, ver bista b'chal, bista nidiot, get out of my life. But I'm going to be such a gadol that I'll be nice to you. The brain recognizes the uniqueness and the indispensable contribution of every limb in the body to the point that there's a truth where there's no Rosh Vesayf anymore. So somebody who doesn't get this, he says somebody who really creates pirud between the Rosh and the Saif and creates an absolute hierarchy where ultimately there's no real, real oneness and where the mashpia never becomes a makabal in another area and can look up to a person and understand that they have a shlichus in this world where I must be makabal from them. They have wisdom to impart to me. They have inspiration to impart to me. They have something to impart to me. In his Lashen is, This person essentially is a noifel. Noifel means he falls into the fake world of fragmentation, which has nothing to do with Kedusha. This is already Sitra Acher. He could justify it with Maimari Chazal. He, could just, he probably will. But essentially... It's Sitra Acher, this is not Kedush. In Kedush, there's always an Akuda of the humility that comes from understanding that infinity doesn't have a beginning and an end. So therefore, even in a world where there are beginnings and ends, there's always the eagle. And in the eagle, every Nikud is a Rosh, and every Nikud is a Saif. Depends from what Pchina, what moment, what time, in what Inyan. Yeah. This is good stuff. <laughs> is he also addressing here the person that that feels that he's only on the bottom and he's not on the top? No, of course. Of course. So he's also a, a sidra. That's also sidra. Of course. Of course. That's a good point. He's not only addressing the arrogant person, he's also addressing the other extreme, the one who always feels he's on the bottom. That's equally sitra acher. That means, again, he does not recognize that in a certain nekuda he's also a rosh, or she's also a rosh. That's also sitra acher, the same nekuda. It's from the opposite extreme. I'm meant to be a loser, I'm meant to be unnoticed, I'm meant to be the nail at the toe, you know? <laughs> Friday afternoon, they give me attention, they cut me off. Some people, the attention they get is the attention that nails get. Shab Friday afternoon before Shabbos come, 
let me get rid of you. <coughs> and that's when they shine. After the mikveh, when you cut the nails. So that's the same nekudah. The same nekudah is that this person, again, if they were in, and, and sometimes that's also in the name of religion and in the name of God. I'm, it's, it, so, it sounds very holy. Being a nobody could sound very holy. I don't take a place. I don't have an ego. Right? I've been a garnished. God is everything, so I'm nothing. But in the real truth, again, of Igulim, of of Saif of Kalalmin, there's a Nekudah where there's no Russian Saif. There was a Yid, I knew a Yid. His name was Rabbi Hecht, Rabbi Avram Hecht. He was the rabbi of the Syrian community in Flatbush. Very wealthy Syrian community. So I once heard from him when he was a Bacher in the 1940s, the previous Lubavitcher Rebbe, the sixth Lubavitcher Rebbe, Rabbi Yosef Yitzchak Schneers, asked him to go speak somewhere. To be Ma'ayrit of Sa'ayla. So he... Um, he refused. He said he's not worthy, whatever. So the Rebbe wrote to him, Anava shaloi bim kaima yisaydasa gaiva. Misplaced humility is rooted in arrogance. <laughs> Misplaced humility is rooted in Anava shaloi bim kaima yisaydasa gaiva. Vihinei. Seven lines from the bottom. V'hi nebere shashan nehu b'chines ha-tshuva sh'klolus nesham es Yisrael t'shuvena l'mekoidim v'sharshim. This, we come back to Atem Nitzavim Hayyoyim, which the Zoyar says is Rishashana. All the ten madregas, Moshe goes through ten types of Jews, which represents a hierarchy. You can't compare the woodchopper to Rashaychem Shifteichem. You can't compare the water carrier to Ziknechem. You can't. You can't compare Yeshua Benun to the Jew who's chopping wood. Scholastically, you can't. Right? In terms of a mind, in terms of a heart, in terms of Ruchnius. It's Taka. There's, diff- there's different types of people. There's Bali Madrega. There's 10 different Madregas. Just like you can't compare the foot to the head. It's a whole different Mahalach. Nonetheless, Moshe says, Atem Nitzavim Hayyim Kulchem Lefnei Hashem Alekechem. Why? Because on Rosh Hashanah, he said, all Nitzutzi Neshamas go back to their Shadish. And Knesset Yisrael is made up of ten, and even the Madregas HaTachtoinus come back, as he said, Leo Yisla Achodim Ke'echot, to become one. And that's what he explained, that the Klal Godel in Kedusha is, always know it's Seifam Betchilasim. The end and the beginning, somehow become one. Because really, there's no Rosh Hashanah. The Rosh Hashanah that we see is only to bring out certain truths in our world. But ultimately the Rosh is in touch with God when it realizes it's not a Rosh. And the Saif is in touch with God when it realizes it's not a Saif. The moment they start taking their own position seriously to the point where I look at you as the Saif and me as the Rosh in an absolute form, then I'm already not in touch with the Ein Loi Rosh Saif, which is the Divine, who has no head and no end. It's Igulam, it's Saif of Kalam. And that's why he explained this, the Habishvar Ruch Bufnei Kaladim. So now he goes back to Rosh Hashanah. Rosh Hashanah is this man of tshuva. What's tshuva? We tie tshuva as repentance. You did bad things. You got to repair. You have to do tshuva. He tied is a little different. Sheklolos neshama zishol tshuvena lemekayin v'sharsh. The word tshuva literally means return. Tshuva is the time that the Kalalus and the Shammas Yisrael go back to their own source, to their own shra- they trace themselves back to their own mucker. That's what the real word Shuvah means. To return to where you came from. I was there. I'm still there, but I think I'm not there anymore. So Shuvah means I should be able to go back to the mucker and Shairish of everything. And that's really the secret of Shuvah. The secret of Shuvah is not to create a new self, it's not even to repair mistakes. Those are all details. Of course you should repair mistakes. The Nekud of Tshuva is to go back to your own Mokr and Shairish. Before all the Bilbulim, before all the confusions. It's to be able to get back to your own pristine self, to your own truest identity, before any situations and circumstances that derailed you from that place. This means spiritually, emotionally, psychologically, and physically on every single level. So he says, 
all the neshamas go back. V'zel bis asif roshayam. On this Moshe says, "Vayhi b'shurin melech bis asif roshayam yachat shifta yisrael." So first he says roshayam, which are the heads of the nation. Then he says yachat shifta yisrael. So he teaches roish upchina samachshava. Roish, the head, the brain is the place of thought. V'roshayam. So what's Roshay Am? Literally means the heads of the nation. But he teaches Beruchnis. It means Pchinas Hamachshavas Shel Klolos Yisrael. Vayhi Bishurim Melech Bisasif Roshay Am means all the thoughts of Klal Yisrael. Shehi Misas Vime Alma De Pruda. They all gather together from a world of fragmentation. Shenoflu Machshavoy Somli Yezepoy Nelikan Vachuli. Their Machshavas all fell and got scattered. This asif Rashi means all the machshavas come together. The nasim rishus hayochid liyichudi is baruch. From rishus harabim they all become a rishus hayochid, a single domain liyichudi is baruch. So what creates this type of achdus is vayib bishur melech this asif Rashi yom that the machshavas, the machshavas could come together. You have a unity where two people are in the same room, their bodies are in the same room. But you can have two people in the same room looking at each other, but their thoughts are so fragmented. I'm wishing this person never was born, and this person is also wishing his colleague was never born. You're looking each other in the eyes. You're sitting right near each other. Physically, you have the greatest achdus. You can be touching each other. Abbasidish again, in the world of machshava, your world's apart. Your universe is apart. Millennia apart. Complete. That's a Rishus Rab. The definition of a Rishus Rab means a public domain. In Halach it means, of course, a place that's made for the public. It's open. On a deeper level, what's a Rishus Rab? Everybody's on their own. You have Shishim Ribay people. Yeah, you walk on uh, 2nd Avenue, Madison Avenue, 5th Avenue, Manhattan. You have hundreds of thousands of people walking. Today everybody's with a, with a phone, looking at the phone, bumping into the poles and everybody else because they're texting. And uh, everybody is in their own world. Everybody, how many machshavas? The, the Rishus Rabbim is not the people, it's the machshavas. It's the machshavas, which is the core, the pnimis of the person. And then you have two people sitting sitting on two parts of the world. They're completely separate, but their machshavas are in the same place. Their machshavas, their thoughts are in the same place. That's so they're in a Rishus they're in a private domain. By Hebrew and Melech, Bis Asif. Roshay Am, Rosh is the place of Machshava. That the Machshavas of all Neshamas Yisrael come together. Why? Because they're really one. You have it, a couple. You can have a couple living in the same house, which is what couples usually do, for good or for bad. But their Machshavas are never in the same place. So there's never a moment of unity. And what I mean, Machshavas, is not just what they're thinking about. He's thinking about baseball, and she's thinking about whatever she's thinking about. I mean, their way of thought is never the same. Their thoughts never meet up. What I'm thinking, you don't understand. What you're thinking, I don't understand. I misinterpret you, you misinterpret me. We never connect. We never connect on a machshava level. They could connect on many other levels, but their thoughts never meet. What's the expression? The the, The twain shall never meet. The twain shall never meet. No, S. The twain. The twain shall never meet. If Isaac was here, he would Google it. He'll tell him what I said. So what's the pshat? That their machshavas never really come together. We just, we never get it. It's like, it's always misunderstanding. Misinterpretation. Not necessarily malicious. So there's absolutely no unity. You have people living together, but they never really become one because their thoughts never meet. Their internal machshavas never meet. So it's like completely two different worlds. Anybody knows what I'm talking about? <laughs> and you have to work on that. So you're living in a Rishus HaYachid halachically, but you're living in a Rishus HaRabim. Sometimes you come into a house, halachically it's a Rishus HaYachid. It has four walls with a roof. You can't have a better Rishus HaYachid. But spiritually, it's a Rishus Arabim. You're not in a private domain, you're in a public domain. You know why? The husband lives in his world, the wife lives in her world, and every child lives in their own world. And nobody's thoughts ever come together. Everybody knows how to work the other person. We're talking about civilized people. They all know how to, um, you know, make it work. 
I do this, I do that, you do this. But it's essentially like a business with cubicles, you know? Cubicles. So there's no physical cubicles, but there's emotional cub- cubicles. No synergy. No synergy. never come together. The pnimius never comes together. We just don't... Uh, there's no convergence. Huh? Everybody should wash dishes together. Everybody should wash dishes together. So I mean, it could help also. It's not such a bad idea. But... Uh, you're saying once you wash dishes together, the machshavas will already come together. We're talking about soap, mitzmatas, with hot water, with cold water. You say, okay, that's one way of doing it. Nishka ferlach. You go from the gashmis to the ruchnis. So he fascinatingly, bis asif rosh means the machshavas of neshamis yisrael come together. Why? Because that's what makes it not really a rosh and a soif. The rosh and the soif are really just reflections of achdos, of one rosh so it's not any more pointer lakan lakan. Valderech zel pirush shma yisrael. This is also the title of shma yisrael. Literally, what's shma yisrael? Hero Israel. Shma shmiya. Loshin asifim. Loshin by yishama shol. You have in Tanakh and Shmuel by yishama shol means shol gathered. Shma yisrael means by yishama loshin asifim to gather. Shma yisrael means gather together yisrael. Because Hashem Alekeinu Hashem Echad. When you realize Hashem Echad, so Shema Yisrael. You could come together. Shema from the word Vayishama Shol, he brought them together. So Shema Yisrael doesn't only mean to hear, it means what should you hear? Shema Yisrael, get together, converge. Because everything comes from Echad. So therefore there's no absolute relation. So. Coming together doesn't mean you have the same mashallah. No. It's tolerance and acceptance and the realization that it's it's similar like you similar similar you have a Yeah, no, you don't have the same mashava. But it means the mashavas are intertwined. They're harmonized together. There's a harmony, yeah. But we have to appreciate that and work that. Yeah. Like like notes in a song. Yeah. It's not you never have the same notes. But but it's one niggin. It's a niggin. We're, we're and you know what different instruments. Different, different instruments and different notes. But in terms of the pitch, the objective. there's a pitch, you know what I mean? When I was a child, a young, we were in a choir, the yeshiva, they had a choir, Ali Lipska's choir. So it was very exciting because we would get out of school a lot. Uh, we sang with Mordechai Ben David and, and Joe Amar, you remember Joe Amar and all the Olav HaShalom. Avram Ophid was still practicing then. So... Uh, Oh, so I remember it was once a big, a big, uh, a big uh, I don't know, Brooklyn College or whatever. They had a, a concert, and I think it was 1981. So uh, the guy near me, so it was a choir, no, 20 kids, 30 kids. So there was a boy near me, I still remember. They were in the middle of a song, and he got mixed up. So he just started to sing a different tune. So you have 20 boys, and one is singing, and he had a loud, loud voice. So he starts singing a different tune, and it's Reich Aktions. And it's, uh, and I still remember the face of the conductor, of the, conductor <laughs> the choir master. He literally wanted to punch this boy in the face and bury him, because he was ruining the whole thing. But he couldn't, because the whole island was watching. And he was staring him down, and uh, this boy was not getting it. Until the end of the niggin, he was just singing his own thing. So that's, the, that's, that's the idea. It's different voices, mm-hmm. but they're synchronized. They say a story about the Balshamtev. I guess it conveys a lot of the point, of some of the points that were being made. The Balshamtev once told a story to his Talmud and to his students about two Jews. Balshamtev was trying to bring out a point, which is often how you bring out a point through a story. And the story the Balshamtev shared was there were two Jews who were neighbors. 
One had a schus of being what you would call today a ben a big Talmud Chachem. And he was a Yoshevoy, he would sit and learn his whole life. That's what he did. He was supported by whoever supported him, his wife or the Shver, whatever it was. You had in the Edom of Kes, the son-in-law who would sit. I guess you still have it today. <laughs> but it's not called Kes anymore, but that was the Yiddish expression, on Edom of Kes, you would sit for years and your father-in-law would support you. And this was a Jew who was a Yoshev Oyel, very, very serious Talmud Chachem, who sat and learned Yom of whenever he could, that's what he did. He had a Shachem, a neighbor, who was a very simple person. He wasn't educated. Remember, those were the years not everybody went to Yeshiva. Until you were 12, you went to Cheder. And then after that, uh, they sent you off to work. You became a blacksmith or a goldsmith or a silversmith or a carpenter. Or whatever you did in the little shtetlach, your profession, whether you were a farmer or a, <coughs> a trademan or a merchant. But uh, this was this Jew. He wasn't matzliach in learning. And uh, after the mitzvah, they sent him off to work. He also never had an education. He didn't have parents. But he was a Yirei Shamayim. He was an Ehrlich person. And very simple and humble and God-fearing. And he had a tremendous respect for Torah and a yearning for it. But he never had the skills or the ability or anybody to help master it. And he lived in a very simple fashion in terms of literacy and education. And the Baal Shem Tov says, these two Jews would meet every day. After Shachris, they would go home to eat something, and this young man, one man, went to learn, and one of them went to work. The person who was a big Talmud Chachem felt it was below his dignity to greet the other person warmly because he's a classical Amaretz. And then the division between Talmud Chacham and Amaretz were very profound. Instead of greeting him, he would give him this look of disdain. Just a look. He wouldn't say a word, but this look of disdain as he would go out and he would go out. The look of disdain. And the other person would look with a certain envy, with a certain uh, a certain respect, like wow, you know, like almost like a little child, you know, looking at this uh, this great person. Moshe said that this Yid, who was a very simple man, he wasn't educated and he wasn't literate, he didn't even know a lot of things, and because you know, he got involved and in, in, you know making a living, and then he was growing and growing, so sometimes he started to be nichshel. He started to be nichshel in different Avedis. Some of them were Bershaygit because he didn't know better. And then ultimately, you know, he developed a life which was not very uh, morally upright in different areas. Okay, and so their lives continued. And then, he says, the final day came, they grew older and they passed away. So then they both came up to the heavenly court. Which was illustrating to his students in the graphic you know, the graphic illustrations that they used to give to explain his point. Moshem Tov says, this Yid, this Talmud Chacham comes up and all the Malachim come out. Toys into Blad Gemara. Thousands of Toys for sin. I want to say the Rebbe Eger, but this is the Baal Shem Tov, so it's before the Rebbe Eger. <laughs> Even though most people would put in the Rebbe Eger here because historically it doesn't have to work. The Rebbe Eger was uh, born after the Baal Shem Tov passed away. And, uh, and uh, okay, so we can't put in a Bakivega, but we can put it in a Rajbim with a Ramban, with a Ritva. <coughs> Everything went, and they have a scale, right? So they put in all the Gemara, with all the Mishnayas, with all the Chidushatan, you would write Chidushatan, they took all the notebooks. Everything went. And the few little sins that he had, Mamish, nothing he said and learned. And the mitzvahs were going down and down and heavier and heavier and heavier. And the poor Avedis were all the way up there, Mamash, like a few feathers. And his Torah and his mitzvahs and his, his, his dedication to learning and Asmada and Shkida and Ga'inis, he just waited, waited, waited down. It was unbelievable. Wow. What you call a slam dunk straight into Ganeid. The other guy, Nebuch, comes. What was he involved with? He was involved in the physical world, very little Torah, very little mitzvahs. I mean, he gave some zdok. He was a nice man. He, he tried to be an elich person, but he never knew nothing. So they started to put up his Torah. It was like a few feathers, garnished. 
And on the other hand, he made, as I said, a lot of mistakes in his life. He didn't know better. And that started to weigh down the scale. And you looked at the two scales and you saw the difference of two lives. And the Baal Shem Tov said, and it seemed like a slam dunk straight to Gehenna. And then he said, before they gave the verdict, they said, there's one more thing. When this Jew would go out and he would look at this other Jew going to learn, there was a certain sense of, of envy, of respect, of yearning. In heaven, they also look at yearning, at longing. So they took that yearning and they put it onto the scale. So the yearning was so profound, <laughs> it weighed down the whole scale. That yearning. The makim shamachshafte shaladam, sham hu nimtza. Where your thoughts are, that's where you are. Where your desires are, that's where, even though you're not there. Where you want to be, that's where you are. That's where he was. It went down. And then they said there's one more thing for the other guy. Every day when he would look at this person, there was this disdain. Like, how do you even dare walk in my Dalit Amas? They took that look and they put it on the scale. <laughs> and he said, and it weighed down the whole thing. It weighed down the whole thing. Why? Because his whole Torah was fueled. The whole Torah was fueled with that disdain. Every second of learning had that sense of, of disrespect, of, of disdain to the person who was not like him, to the person who didn't go into his elite group. So the whole Torah was affected by it. And the other person, all of his life, had that look of envy, that fueled it all. It was always there. So it turned out, he said, at the end, that uh, what seemed in the beginning as a slam dunk this way, right. turned out exactly the other way. <clears throat> he was trying to bring something out, of course. He was trying to bring out this Nakuda, or at least one of the Nakudas here. Okay. okay. All right. Thank you. to do with proximity. Right. You could be close to someone right. you could be sitting. Yeah. You could be close physically and emotionally. This class is brought to you by the yeshiva.net. Please help us continue the classes. Make even a small contribution at www.theyeshiva.net slash donate.